After finishing high school, he earned $20,000 selling Italian ice at a local beach. He published a memoir, The Wolf of Wall Street, which was adapted into a highly successful movie. Before becoming The Wolf of Wall Street, he wanted to be a dentist. He's Jordan Belfort, and here's my take on his Top 10 Rules of Success, Volume 3. Enjoy! Alright, let's kick it off with rule number one, get pumped up. Guys, I want you to humor me one time. Let's go. Come on. Come on. Come on. All right, stop. Guess what? I never actually did that. Here's what I did do, though. The story is, is that when they were filming that scene, it was the first scene Matthew McConaughey was filming. And he, right before they start, he goes off into the corner, and Scorsese's there, and DiCaprio, and he goes, uh-huh, uh-huh. And Mark's like, what the hell is this guy doing? And he's like, uh-huh, uh-huh. And Leo's like, it's like his kind of like little chant he does to get himself into state. And Mark's like, I love this, because we have to make this part of the movie. And it actually became this whole war cry throughout the movie, and everyone just loved it. Now there's like, you know, you look at the, the Tomorrowland, and, all the, and the soccer guys in the World Cup are doing it. It's hysterical. But here's the deal. What Matthew McConaughey is doing, he's getting himself into a state for acting, a state of certainty, confidence, clarity, right? And today, and you've probably heard this, we call that state management. But back in the day when I was first, you know, cutting my teeth and training the Stratonites, right? And, excuse me, we called it staying positive, not getting negative. And I knew intuitively from my own experience, and I'll tell you, it's phenomenal, you're gonna love it, right? That if my brokers got negative, they wouldn't produce. Unless they were pumped up in a peak state, so every morning, We'd stand up, I had them squeeze their hands together and say the word, yes. That's what we do, just yes. And again, yes, until the one went, Chris, well, let's do that real quick. Ready? One, two, three. Yes. yes. Squeak. One, two, three. Yes. Louder. One, two, three. Yes. Rule number two, master your craft. Let me tell you, this, this, is, this is probably one of the most important things when it comes to success. In every endeavor you go for, whatever job, whatever, whatever business you start, there's gonna be certain specialized skills that are required, and you need to become extraordinary at them. Let me tell you a story. How did this whole thing happen in my life, right? How did I write this book, okay? How did I go out and take this book and turn it into this whole business that formed a movie and a global brand, right? Well, let me tell you something. I was in jail, okay? And when I show up for jail, who's my bunkmate? Believe it or not. Tommy Chong from Cheech and Chong. You know Cheech and Chong? <laughs> He's my bunk mate. Right? Now I didn't go to, I wasn't in the worst jail in the world, I admit it. I wasn't getting butt f each night, my boat's not there. <laughs> it was a federal prison camp, okay? It was okay, it wasn't, but still jail's jail and it sucks, right? Tommy's my bunk mate, because we were both celebrities, they put us together in one cube. It was a little cube with it. He's writing a book, right? So Tommy says to me, oh my God, we tell each other stories at night, and I have him rolling on the floor laughing. Man. So by night three, he goes, you know, I thought you were making this shit up, but my wife Googled you, and it's all true. You live this crazy life. Goes, you got to write a book. You got you to write about this stuff. So I said, well, I don't know how to write. He says, well, just write the way you speak, the way you tell a story. So, well, guess what? I tried that, doesn't work. <laughs> Writing and speaking are very different skill sets. They just are completely different. And for the first month or so, I'm writing a couple of pages. I show them to Tommy. He reads and goes, wow, that really sucks. I'm like, thanks, Tommy. Tell me what you really think, right? <laughs> and I was depressed because I couldn't get anything out in paper that was meaningful or funny, right? And I almost was going to stop, and I hate quitting anything. And I went to the prison library one day, this prison library, right? And I stumbled upon a book called Bonfire of the Vanities by Tom Wolfe. And I start reading this book. And it's, I'm like, oh, my God, this is how I want to write. So I plow through the book. Finish it, and I start back at page one. I take out a yellow highlighter, and I use this book like a textbook. And for three months, I ripped apart every single word, and I broke down Tom Wolfe's strategy for writing. Sometimes, it doesn't matter how much you want something or how hard you're willing to work to get something. If you don't possess the actual skill set that's required to do it, 
It's delusion. And most people don't get that. They'll try to go into a business that's sales-based, but not master the art of sales and persuasion. They'll try to go into another type of business, not master whatever it might be. They don't master their craft. But the first thing you gotta do is say, okay, I wanna do this, what specialized skills do I need to learn and take the time to learn them. Master your craft. Rule number three, don't care what haters think. When I wrote the book, I knew I put myself out there for public course, scrutiny, yeah. um, that I get a lot of detractors, but you know what? I mean, I, you know, in the end, in the internet, like, I think if Jesus Christ gave a sermon on the Temple Mount, his famous sermon, you'd have people, trolls, there's nothing new there, that's bullshit. He's full like, you know, what you do, people are gonna say it sucks, right, you know what I'm saying? And you live in that sort of world where you just have people that are gonna love you and people that are gonna hate you. So I think that the haters serve a purpose. Um, so, you know, I don't even think much about it. Rule number four, get rid of limiting beliefs. A belief, a limiting belief is like putting the a, a governor on the engine of a Ferrari. The Ferrari can go 240 miles an hour, it has 550 horsepower, four valves per cylinder, 12 cylinders, but if there's that governor not letting the gas go through, you ain't going over 55. Yep. That's what a limiting belief does. It stops you from charging forward when you should and cause you to move back when you shouldn't. And we yep. all have them. Agree. And they yeah. started getting inserted in our heads when we were yay big. You know, we were all unstoppable on day one. Hmm. And then came day two when our parents started spoon feeding us limiting beliefs. Sometimes, you know, they meant well, they just didn't know. Because, you know, one of the things that I'm a big believer is that we were not even given our owner's manual. Hmm. Our brain's an immensely powerful computer. And this is you know, known by, by pretty much everybody in the self-development world, some of the top people, Dr. Richard Bandler, who I trained with, a great one of my mentors and a brilliant guy. And the first thing he said to me is, you know, you never got your owner's manual, Jordan. And because of that, you don't realize that the world around you that you take it is reality. It's really not, it's subjective. Mm. The reality I'm looking at is just subjective. I can interpret things how I want. I can have the beliefs that, 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 that empower me and I can shed the beliefs that disempower me. So the first thing I do when I meet somebody, I work when I coach really wealthy people, some stars in Hollywood, the first thing I do is go through what their limiting beliefs are. Yep. And you gotta root them out, and it's not difficult. You, gotta, you can't just root them out, you gotta replace them with empowering beliefs, which is typically the opposite belief. If you wanna have more confidence, check out my 254 series, it's free. The link to join is in the description below. The only thing that stops you from getting what you want in life is the bullshit story you tell yourself. Rule number five, fail elegantly. Thou shalt commit thyself to mastering the art of failing elegantly. This is an entrepreneurial tactic which most young people don't know because they haven't failed yet, really failed. There's two ways to fail in life, in business. Let's talk about business. You can fail elegantly or you can fail miserably, okay? Failing elegantly is a way of going about starting a business or launching a new division of a company that allows you to test out an idea or a concept quickly to get your re, whether it's right or wrong, whether the workshop doesn't work, without losing a fortune, without losing a lot of time, versus failing miserably where you lose tons of money, it takes a lot of time, and you end up with nothing but a bankruptcy. Now I, in, when I was 22 years old, and I launched my first real business, I went bankrupt. It was the meat and seafood business. I started with one truck, I grew to 26 trucks, was making a ton of money, I thought, but I was making every mistake a young entrepreneur can make. I was overexpanding, I was growing with credit, I was undercapitalized, wasn't screening out my employees. Before I knew it, I was out of business and I failed miserably, lost everything and declared bankruptcy. Nowadays, when I'm approached with an idea and I like it, I'm gonna test the idea, I'll do it in a way that A, if I'm wrong, I don't lose much money, or better yet, I'll use other people's money. <laughs> Seriously, I'll always take in an investor and make less on the upside if it means I can protect myself on the downside. And B, I always structure my tests so I get my reads as quickly as possible, so I know quickly the information. And then I can change my approach and try again. Change my approach, and sure enough, by doing that again and again, eventually, you'll hit on the right formula. I don't care how smart you are. It's so rare that when you go into business or you try something new that you get it right the first time. The first evolution of an idea is not usually the right one. And what you see that all through history, businesses after business, where they all are now making money, not on how they thought they'd make money. It's some evolution of the idea. If you fail miserably, you'll never get the chance. By structuring your test so you can fail elegantly, you can test, test again and so forth. Rule number six, maintain your ethics. Often you think when you're younger, 
or even when you're old, if you haven't had this, this lesson taught to you the hard way, is that I can be half pregnant when it comes to ethics. In other words, I can be ethical, but eh, maybe I can step over the line yeah. once and get away with it. Yeah. The problem with that is that when you step over the ethical line once, your line of ethics moves a bit. Mm. So next time you step over, you'll step a bit further over That's the line. That's such a good point. Further. So, so with me, you know, I became desensitized to, to essentially right and wrong behavior. And it's very easy on Wall Street with a lot of people, as you as we found out in 2007, it wasn't just me, it was oh. everyone. Oh, even, but 50 times bigger than what you were doing. Some of these guys cost a lot of people the money. The point is, I, you know, I always say, everyone's doing it. That's no excuse sure. for me doing it. Sure. I did what I did, it was wrong. Yeah. But the point was, it's very easy to point and say, well, everyone's doing it. So y- y- you have to- That's such a good y- point. Y- you have to maintain your ethics, you yeah. really do. There's no- How do you do that? It's very simple, it really is very simple. You just don't take the first step. Got it. That's it, and that's the secret. There's no way you could take, you can't like just take a step and dabble it and then be a good person. Mm-hmm. It's very, very hard. Rule number seven, don't settle for average. I'm a believer, okay, that the enemy of greatness in life is good. Here's the problem. When people are going through life, if things are okay, they aren't feeling enough pain to make a change. It's like if I say to you right now, I say, okay, everybody raise your hand as high as you possibly can. Everyone raise your hand as high as you possibly can right now. Everyone do that, please. High as you can. Now just a little bit higher, a little higher. What the f*** is that, right? I, I, I said, I meant the first time, I said raise as high as you can, a little, oh, if you really mean it. It's that level above where your comfort zone is. That's where I want you to shoot for. Don't go through life burning at 10 watts or 50. Be a 100 watt person and burn bright. Don't settle for average. You know, they're, they're, they're like in the movie, they say there's no nobility in poverty, right? Well, this is not a poverty crowd, right? No one here is going to probably end up in poverty. But don't go through life, whatever average means to you, don't let that be your life. Rule number eight master your state. And there are certain states of mind, certain emotional states that lead people to massive poverty. States like fear, like greed, uh, uncertainty, confusion, overwhelm. Then there are other states that set you up to be massively successful. States of certainty, states of compassion, states of clarity, states of courage. Right? So the first step is, is you could be great as an entrepreneur, meaning you have great business skills, you know how to build a company, you're a great salesperson, a great marketer. But if you're walking around all day long like an emotional basket case, good luck trying to be wealthy and successful. You know, you'll make money, then you'll make bad decisions because you're in a disempowered state, you lose money, right? So you have to learn, not always like a robot, but you have to learn that when it matters, in that key moment, you have to be able to trigger the right state. Rule number nine, delay gratification. Let's just say if you were to change two or three things for this to have lasted, what would those two or three things be? Number one for sure would be the delaying the gratification. The biggest problem I had was- Delaying the gratification. Yeah, that's a problem that a lot of young entrepreneurs yeah. have. And, and I learned that the hard way, is that um, good things take time. And there were some moves I made that made me a lot of money in the short term, but then created problems for me over the long term. And for example, like Steve Madden Shoes is one of my companies, right? I remember that. Yeah. I was the majority shareholder of Steve Madden Shoes. If I had not had that problem from all the stuff I did earlier, I would have made 700 million, a billion dollars on that. Of just off of that one wow. deal versus making 20, 30 million dollars. Got it. Because I was forced to sell it too early, right? That's one example. Um, and there's so many other examples just like that where, for instance, if I would have not gotten in trouble, um, I would have made the dot com boom and been positioned to have the biggest firm out there during internet craze. I would have made it billions off of that. So um, while I made a little bit of extra money sooner, it cost me a lot more long term by not playing that sort of long game, playing the short game. And I think that's a big mistake a lot of people make. And rule number 10, the last one before a very special bonus clip, is stand up for yourself. Jordan, did you actually feel that the film depicted you accurately or did it, did it create a hero that didn't deserve to be a hero? It's a movie. It's a guilty pleasure more than anything and it's not meant to be a moral judgment. It's meant to basically make no moral judgment. This is exactly what Marty Scorsese said. He's not there to judge the characters. He's there to put a story on screen and let the people who watch it draw their own conclusions. She could be offended, someone else could clap their hands, say it's the greatest thing in the world. Now I can tell you, I get hundreds of emails a day from people around the world who've either read the book or seen the movie. 
98% of them are incredibly positive, empowering, great emails. They saw the movie, they got it. They, wow, the motivation was great, the sales was great, but I know the mistakes you made, I never wanna do that. I can learn from the bad as well as the good. 2% of them are morons, say, I wanna do quaaludes and have sex with hookers, okay? And those people are assholes, all right? Now, <laughs> now frankly, if you're, if you're sitting in this audience right now and you can't go to see The Wolf of Wall Street and realize that it's bad, there's something wrong with you. This, it's, it's honest, you're, you're fundamentally screwed up. It's obvious that it's not meant to, is, is some stuff glamorous? Yes, drugs is glamorous, money's glamorous, sex is glamorous. Does that mean it's what you wanna do with your life? It's, it, in other words, it's, it's temptation, it's part of the human condition, and it's entertainment. So I think that you know, to make so much, like people will go to the movie and that's what's gonna cause them to be good or bad. Well, here's the thing, when I looked at Wall Street, I idolized Gordon Gecko, and the biggest problem I have with it is he didn't take the fall. In the, in the movie Wall Street 1, he ended up on top. And perhaps if he would have fallen in the movie, I would have felt differently. At the end, he was, you never knew what happened. At least in The Wolf of Wall Street, I lose everything. My life is destroyed, I go to jail. So it, it, I think a smart person can go to see this movie and get what it's about. I, I, don't, I think I give people more credit than that, I just do. Kelly, the 98% of the people who write supportive letters to Jordan, does that horrify you? Or do you actually think that- No, I don't think your story is a, is a movie or, so, I mean, we're living this story right now. I don't think there are many people who look at poor Jordan Belfort and think, wow, this is a cautionary tale. He sold out the 92nd Street Y. He's going on a 45 city tour and he's got a TV series that he's, what? But, but, why is, but why is it, see, you look, you th you're looking at things are very black and white, though, But because I did that because I've turned my life around over the last years. I was out committing crimes right now. People want to believe in redemption in this world. Maybe some don't, most do. Most people want to believe in second chances. They want to believe in redemption. They, people go through life and make mistakes and want to come back from that. And when they look at my life now and say, this guy made all these mistakes, and look how he's living his life today, it gives them hope. Okay, and if you want to live in a world where there's no hope and if you make a mistake, you're done, it's game over, then that's a pretty sad world to live in, my you're, belief. You're right, but I think that's why, that's, you're right, he's right, but let me just say, I agree, and, and the reason why people press you on your finances and everything is because there's not a real sense that this is a redemption story. There's a sense that this is a story of, wow, look at this thing I did, the time that I served, but I turned it around now, and now I'm telling you about it, and like, People don't press me, journalists do. Well, no, <laughs> because they want to write bad news because bad news sells more than good news. Bottom line, okay? No one ever, no one outside of journalists ever asks me, but, in, but journalists can ask me if they want, but it's because they want to sell newspapers and make a stereo where there is none. Let me put it this way. If there was a Wall Street billionaire tomorrow that said, you know what, I don't, I don't want Jordan Belfort to get this publicity. I'm gonna pay back the $200 million to everyone who was affected so that nobody ever has to pay another dime to hear his story. People would want to hear even more about that. That would make the story even more sensational. So, <laughs> you, you, people love this story. This story uh, that's what I'm this, saying. You no, know, but they love, you're missing the point. You relate it to the, it's not just the money. It's about the most of. It's about someone who lived a life, was almost dying every single day, had a massive drug addiction, had insane talent in certain aspects of business, misused it, manipulated people, destroyed his own life, and was able to come, it's, it's a story that is, it's very extreme. But you're selling successfully that story now. Well, why would I, should I sell it unsuccessfully? What I'm saying is... <laughs> I don't understand. I'm just saying... We live in America, right? Yes, but I think people would like to see you selling what? Bibles. Really? <laughs> or some... Who wants know, to see me sell Bibles? I, I don't know what you're talking about. No, let me put it... Do you think... Do you think... I could be a great Bible salesman, by the way. Changed? Now, I've got a special bonus clip from Jordan on how to stay on the right path that I think you're going to enjoy. But before that, it's time for the three-point landing questions. Let's go from just watching a video to taking action. Here we go. Question number one, where do you need to delay gratification to chase your goals? Number two, where do you need to stand up for yourself? And number three, where do you need to stop settling for average? So having been in the dark side and now gone through it, I mean, because people always have to wonder, can a tiger change its stripes? I mean, really. Can or a leopard person... change the spots. Yeah, right? whatever, you know, whatever, a zebra, you know, whatever yeah. you, you <laughs> want to use as the analogy. I mean, can people really, do they really change? I mean, is there, is Good it... question, and here's the, the answer. I think the answer is yes, but very, very infrequently. And the way that relates to myself is I don't really view myself as a leopard who changed his spots. 
In fact, I started off good. I was raised well by a family that had the highest ethical standards. So I started off as a good boy. I didn't go into the world as a sociopath. I went into Wall Street and allowed myself to get corrupted by greed uh, and drug addiction. So it wasn't like I you know, was this awful human being from the start. I was a good kid that did everything right, did well in school, and I was really supposed to go one way. And I took a left turn in Albuquerque somehow and ended up in this place where I was doing things I never thought I'd do, right. associating with people I never thought I'd associate with, and it all seemed perfectly okay. So my transition wasn't so much from this awful human being to this pillar of the community. I started off as a pillar of the community, took this left turn in Albuquerque, and then kind of got my compass back later in life. And that's really more, that's a real more accurate description of my, of my journey. If you want more Jordan Belfort, check out the top 10 rules video right there next to me. I think you'll enjoy it. Continue to believe, and I'll see you there. Most people have goals in life, and we would both think you gotta be goal-oriented. That's the first mistake. The beliefs that we have really control our actions.